Can you all hear me? Good afternoon. Before I formally introduce Dr. Luke, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Courtney Kasdan, a renowned literacy researcher, a member of the New London Group, and the Charles William Elliott Professor of Education Emerita at Harvard Graduate School of Education. <laughs> Dr. Kasdan <laughs> recently had a birthday. And I would like for us to sing happy birthday to her. But I want us to sing a special version of happy birthday by Michigan native Stevie Wonder. Come on up, Dr. Kazan. We're going to sing a little part of it. Okay, let me, let me speed it up a little bit. I better hang on. Okay. Here's the part that's coming up. Here's the part we're going to start singing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You are very welcome. Today, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce one of the most influential literacy scholars of the 21st century, Dr. Allen Luke, Professor Emeritus, Queensland University of Technology, Brisbane, Australia, and the 2016 Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. Dr. Luke is a second generation Chinese American by birth. He grew up in Los Angeles and attended school in Echo Park and Silver Lake. He is an Australian and Canadian dual citizen. Dr. Luke is an educator, researcher, and theorist studying literacy, multiliteracies, applied linguistics, educational sociology, and policy. He has written or edited over 15 books and more than 200 articles and book chapters. He received his Bachelor's of Arts from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He received his teaching certificate, MA and PhD from Simon Fraser University. He taught primary and secondary school in British Columbia and lectured at Simon Fraser and the British Columbia Institute of Technology before taking a position at James Cook University. Dr. Luke has served as Dean of Education at the University of Queensland Deputy Director General for Education for Queensland, the Chief Educational Advisor to the Queensland Minister of Education, the Foundation Dean of the Center for Research and Pedagogy and Practice at the National Institute of Education at Nyang Technological University in Singapore. For more than three decades, Dr. Luke spent time learning about life with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues, students, and friends in Australia, worked in support of Maori education in New Zealand, and more recently, he has worked with Canadian First Nations scholars. Dr. Luke has received numerous honors and awards. Inducted into the Reading Hall of Fame, 2002, 2002, he received the honorary professorship from Beijing Normal University. 2005, honorary doctorate of laws from Simon Fraser University. 
2005 American Educational Research Association Curriculum Studies Book Award, 2011 Research Address, American Educational Research Association, 2013 Lifetime Member, Queensland Teachers Union, 2013 Award for Research Excellence, Australian Literacy Education Association, 2014 Honorary Doctorate of Education from James Cook University, 2015 Officer of the Order of Australia from the Governor General for Service to Australian and International Education. Dr. Luke, with Peter Freebody, originated the four resources model of literacy in the 1990s. Part of the, Lunon, part of the New London Group, he was co-author of the Pedagogy of Multiple Multiliteracies Designing Social Futures, published in the Harvard Ed Review, 1996. Many of you might not know that Dr. Luke listens and plays a lot of music. That's the New London Group. And he writes and plays rock and folk music and the blues. Also, he plays with a 1940s jazz swing band. So yes, it is absolutely true. Dr. Luke is a literacy researcher. He's very cool and he rocks. <laughs> he really has gotten hooked on Canadian rock and folk music from Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, the late and great Leonard Cohen, to Sarah McLaughlin. Dr. Luke, I spent some time listening to some of your favorite artists, but a song by Joni Mitchell, Big Yellow Taxi, really caught my attention. I think many of you in the audience would recognize this song. So we're gonna go a little bit with that. Just a little bit. We sang a little bit of that. I like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Dr. Luke, my LRA colleagues like music too. We are researchers, we are cool, and we rock. So, as Dr. Luke, the 2016 Distinguished Lifetime Achievement recipient is coming to the podium, LRA, scholars, I want you to stand on your feet, clap your hands, and I want to give Dr. Luke an enthusiastic LRA welcome while I play Uptown Funk with a lot of bass in it. Let's go. Uptown Funk. Yeah. Uptown Funk. Yeah. Uptown Funk. Uptown Funk. Bruno, Bruno. Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars. Okay, thank okay. you. 
disc jockey. You know, as researchers, we lose our cords here, so I want to yeah, make sure. Yeah, I know, I know. I have my cord. <laughs> but you got good mic technique, Pat. Yeah. Okay. okay. There we go, man. Okay, there we go. Okay. Oh, gosh. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on Shawnee land, Cherokee land, and Chickasaw land. The Trail of Tears began here. And it continues in the struggle of indigenous people everywhere. And I call upon the wisdom of elders past and present to guide us, to guide us in our deliberations here and today. This is a bittersweet moment for me. Yesterday morning, I flew from my home in Brisbane, Australia, to Los Angeles. As I flew over the city where I was born and raised, I realized too that my heart is broken too with yours, for the land that my grand grandmothers rose from brown feet on, my heart too is broken, for the place where my mother and father waited decades until they could become citizens in a country where they were born, my heart too is broken, for the place where we, where we walked arm in arm as children and as young adults for freedom and rights, my heart too is broken. And for a place that from afar, those of us could see from afar, that we thought had come to realize that its diversity was its strength and the diversity of all living things was the resource that we would need to sustain this planet and to, to sustain each other, uh, my heart too is broken with yours. And with that, and over this, and over the last few weeks, I've come to better understand why I'm here today amongst you, and what I have to do with so many of you who are friends and colleagues and co-authors and collaborators, and others of you who I've never met who have um, maybe read something. And for those of you who have never read anything by me and don't know me at all, I've come to understand why I'm here. It is not to celebrate, and it certainly is not to act as if there is a grand narrative or there is a scheme or there was a plan for this. But it is to reflect, it is to story, it is to understand this historical moment, it is to understand ourselves as, as historical as, as products of history and as historical actors. I want to thank Pat Edwards and, um, and congratulate Pat and CISO and this organization for what I saw yesterday. This is only my second time at this organization, but it certainly is not the same habitus or the same place or the same people that were here when I first, when I first came. And I'll speak a little bit about me meeting Louise Rosenblatt when I came in, in 2002. Um, this took me totally by surprise. Um, I, want to, I, I want to thank um, my colleague and my mentor and my friend, my dear friend and my family, Courtney Kasdan, for coming and joining us today. Her 91st birthday gave me a powerful reason to be here and a powerful reason, and it reminded me of why I do this work, as Courtney always has. I want to also acknowledge, and I have to say something about my editor and family friend, Naomi Silverman, here, who has changed the field with us and been far more instrumental. Um, my, my dear sister, Tara Goldstein, has flown down from, from uh, Toronto and Oise. Uh, my true Canadian sister to, to um, run interference for me, to prop me up and to hold me through this, and my colleague, co-author, student, friend, Barbara Comer, um, is here joining us. So there's a lot of special people here. When Chris Gutierrez and I met in 1981 at a seminar run by Richard C. Anderson at Simon Fraser, and I'm from Simon Fraser and I'm so proud of that, <laughs> 
not from Yale, not from Harvard, Simon Fraser. Um, when Chris and I met, we were the only colored kids in the room, and we drew strength from each other and have over this whole period. So Pat, to see this organization and to hear that declaration yesterday was not the closing of a circle for me and Chris. It was a beginning. And I think that's what the core message that I'm going to try to try to convince you of today is that this is not a moment for despair. This is a moment, this is a beginning, this is a generational challenge. And I'm sure you'll rise to the occasion. I have to also um, acknowledge my supervisor, Suzanne de Castell, who's not here. When Suzanne and I uh, began this work in, we began our work together in 1980, we were told that the work was too political and I was unable to publish any of it because it was Marx-ish, any of it in uh, Reading Research Quarterly or in any of the journals. And ultimately, a whole series of editors in curriculum studies began to open in our field. And thanks to the work of people like Donna Elverman, Rob Tierney, and Judith Green, many of us Australians, many feminists, many people of color, many multiculturalists were invited into this tent and into this community. So for me, I've got one other thing to say here about this. Would all of the members of the Reading Hall of Fame please rise for us? Brian, Jan, Pat, David, Chris, Rob, Ken and Yetta here? Dear Ken and Yetta, okay. Um, thank you all. Thank you all, okay? Thank you all. Uh, I hate the whole notion of a Hall of Fame. Um, maybe someday I'll make the Country Western Hall of Fame. <laughs> and I, I looked up very clearly with the, whether there were any Asian Americans in the Country Western Hall of Fame, and, and none yet. But the, but, um, it took my Aboriginal friends in Australia to teach me that we all have elders. Elders are not just things that indigenous families have. And in my address to AERA in 2011, I spoke about the white elders of our field. And my studies initially of the Dick and Jane readers took me to the legacies of William James, of E.L. Thorndike, of William Gray, and others. And I was speaking to some graduate students today, and I've come to understand, partly through my engagement and calling with indigenous people, and they seem to just keep calling me, I can't seem to get away. But I've come to understand that, and I've come to understand through my, through my parents and my mother-in-law and, and my mother-in-law and my, my in-laws, and I'm also old now. I've come to understand that education is an intergenerational and intercultural exchange more than anything else. And what I want to do today is not celebrate any career or any corpus of work, but I want to take to those of you who are going to have to fight this next revolution and those of you who are going to be this generation, who are going to run this organization of others, what I want you to do is, is I want to indicate to you that you are part of a larger intergenerational and intercultural conversation that goes back to William James and Wilhelm Wundt and Martin Luther, that the formation of the field of literacy has been a conversation about its moral and scientific foundation. And I've been so privileged, this Chinese kid from LA, to be part of that conversation. My father, Edwin S. Luke, was born in Seattle in 1910 1911, and I wrote my paper, Genres of Power, which was a critique of the notion that literacy, that was promulgated by Freire and others, that literacy gave power. And I remember that night that I wrote the paper, Rukaya Hassan was on the phone to me, and oh, you don't get Rukaya irritated. And Rukaya was saying, where's the paper? Give me the paper. And I had a cold, I think I was taking cold pills, and I was sitting at the computer. And I couldn't come up with an analogy for explaining how literacy didn't make power if you were a person of color in a white society. That it didn't make for power. You could be as literate as you want, but if you were a poor white living in Louisiana 
you are still going to be tarred and feathered in your own way. And I thought about my father's battle. In 1933, he had lost his father and my grandfather in a fight in Chinatown. My grandmother had bound feet and came from China. And in 1933, he graduated as one of the first journalism graduates, he and one other Japanese American of the University of Washington, never to work in a newspaper as a journalist. He was literate. He had a degree. He had cultural capital. And my God, what does it say about you when Bourdieu begins to explain to you your own family? He had, he had a dysfunctional combination of capital that disallowed him from moving ahead. And my mother, bless her soul, who grew up in Punalu on a pig farm in the North Shore of Hawaii, spoke, was bilingual and bidialectal. We spoke English, some Cantonese, and lots of Hawaiian pigeon in the home, okay? But she barely finished high school. And even when we had class, even when we had a Chevrolet and owned a house, certain doors were locked. So what I want to talk today about analytically, and I've got no theory, there's no grand narrative here, but what I want to talk today about is at this historical moment, we cannot simply talk about race without talking about class, without talking about sexuality, without talking about geography and place, without talking about all the ways that we are marginalized and all the ways that certain people are privileged. And I've had, I've had, I, I also have to say that um, Carmen sends her regards to you. She knows we're meeting here. <laughs> and None of this would have been possible without the mysterious Carmen Luke, um, my co-author, my partner, and my wife for 43 years, um, who is the smartest scholar in the house, full stop. Now this all took me by total surprise. In 2013, I deliberately stopped writing and I deliberately stopped doing any work other than mentoring with some colleagues at University of Calgary with First Nations. I really wanted to start another life, and I have been spending the last three years um, songwriting and singing and playing. Um, no matter what we say, and I did make a note as I filled up a notebook in the last while, I wanted to say something about this craft and this work. And this work is treacherous work. This is difficult work. It is privileged. We make money on it. We were wealthy. We have cultural capital. We have voice. Somebody is actually paying us money to talk and think. My God, what a privilege that is, in spite of our deans and our teaching hours and our marking loads. But because this is performative work, because we speak and we act and we teach and we write for a living, because it is that, it is also very, very fragile, potentially narcissistic, potentially problematic work. And I know, for me at least, the power of this work has caused me to want to very deliberately give it a break and see whether I could find truth and life and beauty and relationships other than standing on a podium or writing. So I've been writing songs. Visit ReverbNation.com and listen to some songs, okay? Some good ones. And I actually have a business card of an agent for some Nashville, because as we know, Keith and Nicole live in Nashville, and there's lots of Australian music happening here as well. So when Pat's email came to me about uh, three months ago, and thank you to that committee, I was shocked. I was shocked because what I did not want to do was some kind of psychotherapeutic recollection of what on earth I had done, okay? Uh, it, was, it was exactly the wrong thing that I'd, and I had, I had two reactions. The first was the very one that black feminists, that feminists, I felt like a fraud. I looked at Jerome's name, at Courtney's name, at Mari Clay's name, at the others, and I thought, what am I doing with them? How would this count with them? Because we live in Australia. As Foucault says, you, discourse does eccentric things. We write these things, Barbara and me and others, 
We send them to you. I first wrote at James Cook and had to, had to fax all of the galleys back to Teachers College Press. We write these things and we have no idea what the uptake is. And I can tell you that, the, uh, I can tell you that I'm most proud that teachers in Queensland, that teachers in Ontario use the work and have read the work. But to be honest with you, I had no idea. And I know that it's used in Australia, but I had no idea that there was this uptake. So this took me by surprise. But what does it say also about those of us who are people of color, who continuously feel fraudulent in the academy, even as we stand as a podium on a podium, continually second guess whether we are worthy because we are not born. And in the, the interview that Courtney and I have done for her volume, which will be out next year, one of the things that she said, you must write something about yourself because I didn't really want to. And one of the things I said is that Harvard was never in my future or past. And if there's one thing that I would want to say to a lot of your graduate students is, a lot of you is James Cook, Simon Fraser, okay? I'm a junkyard dog. I do not have that pedigree, okay? I was a frontline teacher educator teaching 14 hours of, of, of research, uh, of, of language arts methods in a non-research institution for 10 years of my life and supervising practica. Low status within the institution, low status within the career. And you know what? That's how we invented this stuff. That's how we changed Queensland and Australian education and a lot of education by working with our student teachers every day, day in, day out. I didn't know this until I was deputy director general running 1,200 schools, supervising 1 million kids and 30,000 teachers. And I found out that in 10 years of pushing those rocks uphill, teaching 14 hours of language arts methods, it had turned out that I had taught one quarter of the Queensland workforce. <laughs> My God. So, so the, for me, to quote an obscure German Jewish philosopher, the purpose of philosophy and research and this organization is not to theorize the world, and it's certainly not to publish in Harvard Ed Review. It's to change that world for better Okay. So there is no grand corpus. There was no grand plan to this work. Um, that was the, the fiction of European academics that there was a Sartrean project that was coherent, that was commensurate, that was philosophically compatible, that there would be a corpus of work, etc. More often, our work is a series of discourse accidents, of displacements, of forms of consciousness and double consciousness. I remember having the great privilege when I edited the series for uh, Taylor and Francis, Critical Studies of Literacy and Education in the, in the 1980s, of, of working with Del Himes, and Del asking me, um, in, as we, he worked through his type, typewritten manuscripts, asking me and said, so do you think it's any good? And I thought, Dell, Dell Himes, <laughs> asking me, Echo Park, do you think this is any good? And I didn't understand it at the time as a young person in their 30s. And I remember David Olson, the, the great Canadian uh, psychologist um, who spoke about literacy doubling the world and creating possible worlds. When we interrogated David Olson at Simon Fraser and said, David, what did you mean in, the, in the, the classic piece from Utterance of Text? David's saying to me, well, you'll have to ask the person who wrote that then, okay? Because we write, we move on, our lives change, we're geographically displaced. So there's no, there's no great story here, but I've had to think, and I've been forced to rethink in some ways how this all happened. And I was drawn about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, Naomi sent me a manuscript to read uh, for refereeing, and it was Arlette Willis's brilliant book on W.E. Du Bois and literacy. And Arlette's book really opened my eyes. And so one of the things that I've done in the last, after coming off of my songwriting and get, coming out of shock over this, and then realizing I had to prepare,
is I went back and I've been reading W.E. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folks. And what Du Bois talks about is Du Bois talks about double consciousness, being seen through the eyes of the other. Now others, Homi Baba, post-colonial theorists, others, Franz Fanon, the African Algerian theorist, have talked a lot about being seen through the eyes of others. Pat was talking about it yesterday when she was relaying her, her family stories. So we're aware of this, but what Fanon talked about, uh, what, what Dubois talked about, and I'm going to, uh, thank you Arlette, if you're here, and I'm going to come back and talk, uh, talk about Dubois later, because he was educated here at Fisk University in Nashville, um, in a black man, a sociologist, our first great, one of, not just our first great African-American sociologist, one of the first great American sociologists, okay? And the first community of ethnography was done on the Philadelphia Negro by Dubois in 1901. He studied at Fisk, the son of slaves, he studied at Fisk between 1894 and 1898, and then he proceeded to go study alongside of Thorndike and, and Gertrude Stein with William James at Harvard as they invented the fields. But you know what he did? He made a side trip to Berlin and he studied with Max Weber for two years at, in Humboldt University where we actually had the opportunity, Ken and Yetta and I and many of us to, to visit and speak several years back. So Dubois talked about double consciousness, but what he was speaking about was he was speaking about this notion that there was a bifurcated subject that you were part African and you were part American and it actually was a part of the oppressive structure of white, white slave, slave culture and white culture actually making judgments about you. Now I've written a piece this month in American Journal of, uh, the, of and I was in dialogue with Ed Gordon who was Dubois' student and colleague about this notion of double consciousness. But trying to understand myself, what I began to realize is that I too have had this double consciousness my whole life. Not just as a Chinese, American, Canadian, Australian, okay? But that the double consciousness is always taken as a deficit in, under the assumption that we find in everybody from Wordsworth to Freud that what is to be celebrated is the unified singular ego identity. That somehow there is a wholeness and a singularity. I had a conversation many years back with a Frankfurt theorist and he sat there and he said, Alan, are, don't you get confused in the morning? You know, wh because you're, you're kind of this and you're kind of that and you're critical theorist, but you're Chinese, but you're not, but you're, he said, I said, you know, Bob, I think this is more a problem for you than it is for me, <laughs> okay? But the, the very notion, when Carmen and I went to write and study inter-ethnic families, all we found were models of deficit from, from do, what I began to realize is that my treks to Canada, to Australia, which I'll tell you a little bit about, have been instances where the privilege of double consciousness has, has given me insights continuously. And I now look at those who have lived at privilege, those who are of my age group, men of a certain age, who did not have double consciousness. And I watch them grappling and struggling and trying to understand what has happened to them. I don't have much problem with it, okay? So for me, the double consciousness, the double masking that Fanon talks about has been epistemic power and privilege. It has enabled me to see and think and observe things, oftentimes, that many others have not. And it's not just by being Chinese American. It's also when I went to Canada and I am still learning what Australia is about with the utmost humility and the utmost respect. Okay? And the one thing that I would brag about, and it comes again, and I, I wore my little pin, because Brian Camborn's here, is the Order of Australia. Because when it came from my adopted country that I have had to work so hard to learn, and for every day 
it is still a struggle. Every day when I was in Singapore, one, one of my um, Anglo colleagues, Anglo-Australian colleagues said, well, what do I do? I'm in an all Chinese culture. I said, every day you wake up and you remind yourself that you understand about 5% of what's going on around you. So it is that humility of, to place. It is that respect of place. And the naming of indigenous people is not just a politically correct de rigueur thing that we learn from Maori and that we learn from Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. It is a way of reminding us of place, of land, of kin, and of our place and our land and our kin. So my narrative is after what my family bequeathed to me, what my church and our pastor George Cole, who was a freedom writer, bequeathed to me, what my brilliant education in the Los Angeles Unified School District at John Marshall High School, shout it out, um, and Ivanhoe Elementary went, gave me, uh, what, what that education gave me is it gave me a commitment to the underdog and to, and to everybody who has been marginalized. It, it's guided me all the way down the line. But I too, and I've spoken with many of you about this, I too was broken in 1968. We have been here before, friends, colleagues. Courtney, Ken, Yetta, they have lived through a blacklisting where they have lost livelihoods, lost friends. They have lived through war. In 1968, we literally had people that we loved and leaders and others killed before us. We had our hopes dashed and others. So we have been here before. And we've risen and we've moved and we've moved forward. So don't despair because there's, lots, there's an awful lot of work to be done. I moved to Canada in 1968, and I, like a lot of my generation, was seeking answers in a political theory of knowledge. And what I was looking for at the time was, I had studied literature, and I had read Hegel, I had read Kierkegaard, I had read Dewey, and I think Hegel had more impact on me than Marx. I had studied with M. Scott Mamaday, Kenneth Rexroth, and studied literature with many people there and had great teachers at Santa Barbara. And when I left, I wanted to find a Marxist theory of language. That is, I wanted to take the notion from Marx in the 1848 manuscripts that the young Marx wrote about alienated labor. And I wanted to substitute the term language for labor. That is, simply talk about how capital and appropriated your language. They owned your language. They took it from you. They marketed your language. They commodified your language. They devalued others' language. That your language would become, and your literacy in due course, would become other for the other. So I went off to try to find that in graduate school at Simon Fraser University, which was the radical school. But I got distracted, and I failed to complete my master's in English literature. So for everybody who's fin failed, it's a, good, it's a good lesson. How did I fail? Well, I married a German-Canadian, had a daughter, and started teaching elementary school without a teaching certificate and secondary school. And the first double consciousness I had was from my Canadian high school students at, at Semiamu Secondary School in White Rock, who would laugh at me for my accent, who would make fun of me for every Americanism that came out of my mouth, and never let me forget that I was a Yankee even though I wasn't quite sure that I was. So that first displacement was, was quite significant. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about the questions of whiteness, because white isn't white isn't white. White Canada is not white America, is not white Australia. Um, Han Chinese is not Singaporean Chinese, is not, we can work this as much as we want to work it. But the, the massification, as Dubois said, of a race is an artifact. It's an artifact of discourse. It is, as Roland Barthes would say, it is history turned into nature. So I want to talk about, and for me, moving to Canada was my first experience in the complexity of whiteness. That these folks ain't like the folks I grew up with. 
there's actually different histories, different attitudes, different beliefs. In fact, I mean, we could celebrate Canada, the Book of Negroes, the Underground Railroad, the, 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 the sovereign haven for people running away from, 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 from slavery. So I wanted to study language, but I got caught up teaching school. In 1975 and 76, I went back to do teacher training, and at Simon Fraser, they brought up a guest lecture for our summer school, and it was Jonathan Kozel. And Kozel handed me a copy of Pedagogy of the Oppress, and he said, read this, man. <laughs> it changed my life. But the other thing that I learned about Kozel, from Kozel was Jonathan taught me a term. Is he said, because we were fired up, we wanted to change the world. We weren't taking no for an answer. We were angry. We were militant. I wasn't into armed struggle, but we, we were going to change it. And Kozel said, mate, well, no, he didn't say mate, sorry. <laughs> he said, don't be radical dumb. And I said, what's radical dumb? And he said, radical dumb is when you fight every battle against everybody that you feel is an oppressor, and you ex expend all of your energy, all of your force, all of your will fighting stuff that doesn't matter. And I said, well, Jonathan, what battles do I fight? And he said, you, you, you fight the battles that aren't about you. And so I learned my first teaching job was in the North Okanagan in a white farming community um, called Armstrong, British Columbia, uh, north of Vernon. At the time, it was a farming community of 5,000. So here I am, radical, revolutionary, Paulo Freire under my arm, ready to engage in conscientiation, uh, to problematize the world. In English 11, teaching of mice and men and Alice Munro to a bunch of white Canadian farm kids. Okay. For me, one of the lessons about teaching for social justice and equity is there are underdogs everywhere. And for me, I redefined it as teaching fairly, equitably, and powerfully the other. And I had to teach kids who were calling me Ching Chong Chinaman on Saturday. I had to meet them in the classroom on Monday. I think some of them said, oops. OK? I had to teach kids who were ideologically, culturally, in color, in background, in genealogy, totally other to myself. They were nominally, as a sociologist, my enemy. But I had to teach them with equity and fairness, and I had to teach them on behalf of justice. So I want you to think about that. Is our stewardship for this field, for me, teaching Asians, teaching people of color, working with LGBTQ, teaching indigenous people, that's a piece of cake because of who I am and, and where I'm from. Teaching the white other was the ultimate challenge of my social justice principles as well. How I could extend my critical education principles and my commitments to people who historically I would have seen as opponents or opposition was a test as well. And I'll speak a little bit about that later on as well. So Kozel geared me up for that. And that was my first lesson about being radical dumb. But the lesson I had, which Jonathan gave me, was when I heard the racist comment or the sexist comment in the staff room, I just said nothing. When it was about a kid and a kid's future, I fought like a demon. So for me, the radical dumb strategy was to fight everything and lose my power to fight on behalf of others. The critical strategy was actually more of a guerrilla strategy. It was all by stealth, was to basically let that go, because that was an insult to me. You know, I can deal with that. In order to use my power on behalf of the kids who actually, whose life it might change. So I took my gospel according to Frere and moved back to the lower mainland, to Burnaby, British Columbia in Vancouver, and I was placed in an ESL classroom to teach English as a second language. And, uh, Pat, how long do I have? 
Oh, cool. Hey, <laughs> you might regret that. Okay. <laughs> and I was placed in Vietnam you know, with the first wave of Vietnamese and, um, and Asian migrants, not because I had any ESL training, but get it, <laughs> you know? Like the school district had me on the books, they're Asian, you're Asian, go for it, mate. So because I did not know contrastive linguistics in the international phonetic alphabet, bless my heart, but I knew Paulo Freire, and I knew something was wrong with these kids who had been on refugee camps and making this long journey, learning to say, this is a secretary, I am toast, or no, I am a secretary, this is toast, out of New Horizons in English in Reinhardt, I knew that this was textbook hegemony of the worst kind. I knew that this was racism of the worst kind, as, as it would be. That didn't take any rocket science. So I shifted the curriculum into a Frarian curriculum that was very much about narrating, telling your story, tracing your journey from Vietnam to Canada. We had maps, we wrote narration. I used um, the classic Frarian and language experience methods of transcription, um, of people telling your stories, transcribing them, using pictographic cues. So we did multiliteracies before we invented it, okay? of using pictographic cues in writing, and we did that. And I remember kids standing up and telling these stories and people weeping in the classroom, okay? And I'd go home at night and I'd think, oh, empowerment, they've been empowered. It's happened, it's working. Only to find out all of the problems in that. One, on one occasion, one of my students didn't come back. And I didn't understand, and I spoke to her sister, and she had mental health problems afterwards and had been in trouble. Me, Chinese, I didn't get it. I didn't understand that the Frarian model was about taking the self and externalizing it. I didn't understand that Frere's combination of Marxism, Christian existentialism, and liberation theology was an extremely Eurocentric one. I didn't understand that, Freire, that the Frarian model was linked very closely to the confessional of speaking the truth and what's inside. I didn't understand what I had done because in my culture, one of my cultures, in Chinese culture, and she was Vietnamese Chinese, Going public with what's inside of you is actually a loss of face. It is actually a betrayal of kin and family. So what is culturally appropriate? What is empowering? And then I went on, and as my colleague and partner Carmen Luke wrote, and Elizabeth Ellsworth, and the feminist critique of radical pedagogy said in, in Carmen and Jen, Jen Gore's book, Feminisms and Critical Pedagogy, the risk is, is that the critical pedagogue becomes what it's all about. The empowerment of others becomes potentially a self-congratulatory rush. And that's what I had experienced. So that was the first thing that really, that everything in our literary traditions, Wordsworth and Coleridge, prefaced lyrical ballads, 1899, the taking of the innermost emotions, and exposing them through our literary expression. The very thing that Louise Rosenblatt and that whole language often were, were speaking about, that those things were very culture specific. And that for many of us culturally, specifically, particularly for indigenous peoples, but also for Confucian based cultures and others, and for Islamic cultures, the making public of what is in your heart and your history and your family and your kin in the white public school what is that? So being critical is not an easy road. It is fraught with mistakes. It is fraught with self-annulling contradictions. So that was my first caveat. The second caveat that I had was my Frarian work. I would watch these kids go off empowered, writing these elaborated narratives and watch them get slaughtered in Science 8 and History 8 
because they could not deal with expository prose. So we know that, as Olson, David Olson explained, we know that the ontogenous of West, ontogeny of Western literacy is an ontogenetic, E.B. Huey talks about this, it's an ontogenetic movement from first person to third person, from narratives of the self to expository third person writing. That's the way that Western literacy is structured. It creates a hierarchical development and Western schooling is a technology for the hierarchical development from first person to third person to the point where you reach graduate school and you're a walking APA. <laughs> it is only after I got tenure and after my indigenous people quit telling me to quit acting like a walking APA citation and to start talking about myself and to tart, start telling stories again that I actually began to find my own self back again. So in fact, what we, what, what we created with the technology of Western literacy and Western literacy schooling means that failure to master the expository third person discourse of, as Michael Halliday has pointed out, the origin of species. The apotheosis of Western prose is in Darwinian prose. In fact, Christopher Spratt coined it in the 18th century, called it Royal Society prose. And Royal Society prose actually consisted of the, what he called, quote, the one-to-one -one correspondence between word and thing. So we have a binary that's been created between narrative orate knowledge and expository textual scientific knowledge, and we, schooling creates an ontogenetic hierarchy that says this counts and that doesn't count. And my Vietnamese students would get the first person from me and from Frere, and then they would walk into science historical work of nominalization, of technical discourse, of passivized grammar, and they would get slaughtered, okay? So the second thing I learned about the Frarian model is that it could not suffice for redistributive social justice. That is the Lisa Del Pet case, okay? Well, this all was this question that we use Nancy Fraser to deal with talking about the difference between recognitive social justice, a social justice of recognition which is all the critical work we do in trying to work with kids to learn other histories and to tell their communities histories and to rewrite histories and redistributive justice, which is learning the tools of the master's house in Audre Lorde's terms. And the question, as Audre Lorde put it, is how do we learn, that? can we deconstruct the master's house with the tools of the master's house, or much less, can we learn the tools of the master's house without losing our souls and our families and our kin and our land in the, in the process, and our first person narratives in the process. So that balancing act between recognitive redistributive justice has been the one that has really guided our work in critical literacy. So then I went back to grad school. Again, all I knew is that Frere didn't have the whole answer, but I still wanted to change it. And that's where I met Chris in 81, and, we, and I remember Bless his heart. Dick Anderson came to teach us, Richard C. Anderson from Center for the Study of Reading. And I remember sitting in, in, in Dick's class and, oh yeah, I was so angry because I was going to have to learn cognitive psychology. So just as Courtney, when she was taught, when she entered Harvard and returned from teaching Puerto Rican kids in high school in, 19, in the 1960s and, and told her colleagues at Harvard, her supervisors, I want to study language and social class. She was told there wasn't such a field. And B, it was going to be deficit models, more or less, that she was going to have to, to follow. And it was a psychological issue, not, she, she had to virtually work with Dell and others to reinvent a field called ethnography of communication that would actually begin to talk about the relationship between language, social class, and difference. Similarly, when we began, when I went back to grad school in 1980, I was told, you want to study literacy, mate? Psychology. And there was Dick. So Dick put theoretical perspectives, and Donna's doing the revision, Donna and David do theoretical perspectives and reading comprehension in my hand, and said, read this. And every time Dick sp spoke, I remember raising my hand and saying, but, but, you know, Frera, but, but, in Marxist terms, but, and I remember Dick being so patient with me, and then about two lessons in saying, 
Mr. Luke, I will give you time to do a seminar on critical approaches in about week 10. In the meantime, would you please sit down and shut up, you know, and learn this? This was the master's tools. I was going to learn, and I, and I had, was reading Stephen Jay Gould's Mismeasure of Man. As a person of color, I felt that psychology was basically a Eurocentric plot to disenfranchise me, to tar and feather me, to do whatever it may be. And Dick said, learn this. And I did, and I thanked him. And what I did in the studies of D the Dick and Jane readers was I put psycholinguistic, psycho, psych psychological text grammars by Bonnie Mayer and others that Dick had taught me together with Marxist theory of ideology. And I found that Dick in Schemata and the Ed Educational Enterprise, a groundbreaking essay, had also spoken about paradigms. He saw Schemata as paradigms. And that Walter Kinch and Dick and Twin Van Dyck and others also had begun to make the link between schemata and culture and schemata and ideology. And as soon as I had that, I was there. I was home free. I had what, part of what I had been looking for, which was a Marxist theory of language. That is, that story grammar analysis, could, that narrative analysis, actually had the tools for explaining how dominant ideologies worked. OK? So there was value in learning the tools of the master. There was value in a non-dialogic holding of my tongue and actually sitting and working and working through dominant, dominant paradigms, dominant research models in order to later move them into something else. Well, in 1984, I couldn't get a job because who was going to hire somebody who kind of was a sociologist, kind of a Marxist, doing this. We got published, and I thank Ian Westbury and the Curriculum Studies and Journal of Curriculum Studies and Curriculum Inquiry, because I couldn't get published in the literacy field. So we got published, and I got a job. I got a telex, telex, from James Cook University of North Queensland. Who was James, James Cook? Hold on, my mother's from Hawaii, James Cook. Hold on, George Vancouver, James Cook. Who is this James Cook guy, okay? Isn't it funny how colonialism touches all of us, and it touches all of us again and again and again? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But I got to James Cook University of North Queensland, again, from Simon Fraser University, with a book, my first, my first book, almost ready, a Marxist analysis of Dick and Jane. Is that going to get you a job? And an anthology that Kieran Egan had, and I and Suzanne had put together called Literacy, Society, and Schooling in 1986. And I was given 14 hours of introduction to language arts, practicum supervision, and then on top of my teaching load, I was placed in the Aboriginal and Islander, Torres Strait Islander teacher education program. And I sat there looking at 14 Aboriginal peoples and Islander peoples, them looking at me, and saying, whoa, okay? I, it was such a cultural transition. There were two television channels. There was no Bob Hawke, who was, was just drinking beer over the America's Cup victory. It was, and I was in North Queensland. These guys are Sydney siders, so they're big city folks. This is North Queensland, just south of Papua New Guinea on the Barrier Reef. You did? Oh my God, oh my God, Brian. So I was there. and. It was a Frarian moment. I looked at them and I said, I really don't know anything about Australia Aborigines. I was even worried because I was trying to teach Dolores Durkins, teaching them to read, and I was trying to explain how to teach phonics, and guess what? Australians, phonemes, <laughs> there was dialect interference. I would go, I would go to the, I would go to the cafe on campus and, and order matches because I smoke cigarettes and I'd get orange juice. So there was clearly some clear intercultural problems that were engaged in. So there was, there, I was sitting there looking at them. They were looking at me. It was a Frarian moment. And all I said to them was, I don't know much, but you know, Bowles and Gintis, schooling in capitalist America, I can teach you that. I, I really did not know what to do. And um, Martin Nakado, who was the first Torres Strait Islander 
um, to receive a PhD and was one of the New London group with us. And Martin looked at me and he said, look, Luke, it'll be okay. He said, and I said, what do you mean? He said, do this. He says, first of all, when I close my eyes, I don't hear the voice of the white Australian school teacher. I hear something else. And that's provocative. That accent, that dialect actually is a stand-in or a proxy for identity and race. And one of my students, Jenny Miller, later wrote a Bordeauxian thesis on racism and accent called audible difference. So in fact, the fact that I spoke in this funny accent somehow made me not, not, not the problem, okay? But the second thing that he said was, which violated all of my APA training, was he said, just tell them who your people are and tell, them your, tell, your, tell us who your people are, where your land is, and what your story is, and everything will be fine. So I did. So I had to learn, begin to learn about myself again. I had to unlearn my APA and learn to begin, I had to reverse that ontological continuum that had turned me into a proper peer refereed third person speaker and learn to speak, or as David Olson used to say, I had to quit talking like a book and I had to start ventriloquizing my kin, okay? I had to start speaking those voices of family, of place, of others. So at that time, there was a little, because I had to teach introduction to language arts, and I had, I assigned Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and Dolores Durkin teaching them to read. <laughs> How do you put those two together? Okay? I was never under the illusion that consciousness raising could teach people phonemic awareness. <laughs> I was never under the illusion, being Chinese, that if I just immersed you in Putinwa, that you would get it. Okay? I knew that this was going, as a second language teacher, I knew that there was a place for reader response, a place for all of these things, and we began to build and hybridize them together. And that was our club. Pam Gilbert, Allison Lee, Barbara Comer, Peter Freebody, Carolyn Baker, Barbara Kamler, myself, Bill Green. We began inventing something with everybody bringing something different to the table of Frere, of reading recovery, of process writing, of whole language, of and of Derrida and deconstruction, of Foucault, and of functional grammar. We began to try to understand how these things, because we're teachers, we're school teachers, how these things might give us a new model of literacy. Okay? How we begin to, to blend. And, and I think part of the most debilitating thing about our field and about academic gamesmanship is we are driven to pursuit of a single method and a single truth. When in fact, teachers are, as Marilyn Cochran Smith and Suzanne Lytle would tell us, teachers are bricolaires. Teachers do work from repertoire. That if all you did was critical pedagogy all day, the kids would be bored to tears. That if all you did was phonemic awareness all day, the kids would be bored to tears. We know as teachers that it requires reading the cohort, reading the syllabus, reading the kids, making instructional decisions, and so forth. So our building of this model was not theoretical hair splitting. It was actually talking about practical deployments. Then our club met, and Brian was caught right, and Jan were caught right in the middle of it, met the other guys, who were the systemic functional grammar, grammarians of Michael Halliday, Jim, Jim Martin, um, Francis Christie, and others, Gunter Kress, and Terry Threadgold, and colleagues. And we began to hash it out. We began to argue it out. It was unpleasant. It was difficult. It was hard. I'm sorry, Brian. You know? It was difficult. It was hard. And we fought, and we argued, etc. Well, Peter Freebody and I 
when one day we were at a conference in Sydney and the battles were on. Critical, they must be critical. No, they must have access to the d d genres of power. No, we must immerse them in literature. No, we must, we were having it out as academics do. Well, teachers continued to do their daily labor. And Peter and I actually left the conference and went into a Chinese restaurant on Broadway Street outside of University of Technology. And we were kind of grossed out and exhausted. And I just turned to him and I said, what if everybody's right? And we said, yeah. And we began to make a map. I don't know, nobody saved the serviette, okay? But we began to make a map. And we put coding, the comprehension stuff, the pragmatic and interactional stuff because Shirley had taught us about literacy events and ESL teachers all knew that you had to use literacy. And then we rebuilt the critical dimension, not just with Frera, because of my disappointments with critical pedagogy, but also using Foucault, Derrida, and functional linguistics. And Jim and, and Fran and Michael Halliday's work and Gunter's work. Because the prototype for that critical discourse analysis was 1978, Gunter Kress and Robert Hodge, language as ideology. It was that early. Now, while we were doing this, and Hillary's here, because you don't just invent this stuff, they're always simultaneous. Norman Fairclough, Hillary Jinks, Catherine Wallace, um, Hamilton, Mary Hamilton, were coming to the same conclusions in the UK in critical language awareness and consciousness. So we developed this stuff autonomously, I think, putting these pieces of the puzzle together. But then came, I think, the other changes for me and the other substantive changes uh, around the work. There were two events that really shifted me. One was, in, was, was when I was at James Cook, Mary Colansis one day was going out, my colleague Mary, was going out to work with women of color on a video for this SBS television uh, channel in Australia. And uh, she said, you've got to come. You've got to meet these women, Linda Burney. You've got to meet Aboriginal people. You've got to meet these people. You've got to work with them. We're doing activist work. And I, sa I said, no, I'm going to stay home. I've got to work. And she said, do you think writing one more article on literacy is going to make any difference to anybody? And I said, ooh. And she said, I said, but I got a deadline. She, I said, what are you going to do? And she said, I'm going to change Australian history. And that, to me, was the challenge. It was the Gramscian challenge. It said, you have tenure. You're published. You got power. Now what are you going to do with it? That is, the very behaviors that had pushed, pushed us through to success potentially could progressively divorced us from what from the constituencies and what mattered, which was working with people in the field and going back to those communities and those schools that were the reason that you got into this business in the first place. Okay? Every time, every time that I and Barbara and several of us, my colleagues Annette Woods, Beryl Exley, every time that we have been lost, every time that we have been confused, Every time when I came back from Singapore and I had lost my way altogether, I did one thing. I went back to schools to try to, to, try to recover what it was that I, where the political and cultural mandate and mission and constituency was and where your heart and soul really were. So I cannot overstress that to you. you know. And I will say, as I did to yesterday, I'm in solidarity with my colleagues at Wayne State, with Jessica at Long Beach State, at the people who are doing the frontline teacher education. Okay? That really is the core business in how we began to change Australian education. So the second challenge that I had, so Mary's challenge was one. It was the Gramscian challenge of you're now a well-paid, tenured academic. Good on you. Now what are you going to do with it? And I put that to all of you. And I would say to you often that the very behavior and the very beha competitive behavior that got you your tenure and your fame can be quite destructive unless you learn some generosity of spirit and, re and, and recommitment later in and middle in your career. So the, the 
second mo moment that I had was in New London, which really was Bill Cope's utopian dream. And New London was Bill's invention. I'm sad to say that our belief in New London was that the juncture, historical juncture of print literacy as a tool of domination and exclusion was being disrupted by the emergence of new technologies and we had a possibility at least of altering the balance of the distribution of, of capital, of altering the, the balance in redistributive literacy, of altering how these technologies were used, of using them and distributing them differently. Unfortunately, I think that that hope and dream is quickly eclipsing and slipping from our fingers. That the digital actually is being recolonized and is, is actually being used in some quite, quite destructive ways as readily as it is. But that's a different topic. Um, but New London was my second encounter with my mentor, Professor Kasdan. And she may partly recall this and partly not, but We've had just arguments about who said what. But when we got to New London, Jim G, I remember her turning to Jim G and me, and she said two things to us. She said, first of all, oh, there are too many big egos in the room. And I thought, she said, it'll never work. But then Courtney, the Quaker, Courtney, the communist, said to me, she said to me, oh, you guys are just those, and me and Jim, you guys are just those critical people. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, oh, well, you just write articles on being critical and everything that's wrong. But you actually aren't out there willing to do it, to work with the kids and with them. And I've all called that since the Courtney Kasdan test, OK? Because I've applied it to others, which is, are you willing to get your hands dirty on this? Are you willing to come out of the ivory tower? Or do you just talk about the stuff? Okay. So I got a call when I was dean at University of Queensland. I got a call from the director general of education who is uh, underneath the Ministry of Education uh, under the labor government of Peter Beattie in 1984 or 5. And Terry Moran, very great man who was, also ran the office of prime minister he got on the phone to me and said, you know, we were in that deans of education meeting, because the bureaucrats meet with the deans every now and then. And he said, you know, you're a really smart, smart guy. He says, you guys are so good at telling us what's wrong. Can you fix it? <laughs> so I reached a point, the point that Chris has reached, the point that David Hopkins in the UK reached, the point that Charles Ungerleider in, of somebody calling our bluff of somebody saying, you talk a good game. If I give you the keys to the car, would you really know how to, to drive it? Would you really know? And I went home. I was in shock, OK? Because I knew what it would bring. The left would say I sold out. The right was saying that I would, was uh, corrupting their children with evil, radical ideas. Academics would say that I had just lost the plot. I would be attacked by the Murdoch press. I would get it by, from the Labor Party. I would get it from the opposition. And I would get it from all directions, much less being a Chinese guy in white Queensland in a Labor government with, a, with a one nation sitting in parliament. It was one of the risks. I was scared to death. But that was, for me, the next level up from Courtney's challenge which is, are you willing to actually mobilize in that direction as well? And what we began is a series of reforms, because we knew, and I had read Scott Paris, I had read a lot of good work at the time, we knew that NCLB was coming, or versions of it, and we knew what it would do. It was two years off, one year's off. So we began to put in whole school literacy planning, multi-literacies, critical literacies, and a whole series of reforms called New Basics, which had rich tasks, really radical stuff, John Dewey, The Child in the Curriculum, 1902, okay? And we began to implement these across Queensland and so forth. They ran for six years before government moved on to the next best thing. 
you ever notice that educational policies seem to change every four years? I wonder why, okay? It wasn't a problem in Singapore, because one party has run everything since the inception, but it was seemed to be a problem. Well, we went through that I went through that last move, which was to take this work and try to actually implement it on some scale and so forth. Now people will now say, and people have written theses and are doing this, is aren't you bitter that they closed it down after six years? Aren't you bitter that that sooner or later our Prime Minister talked to Joel Klein and decided to do our version of, uh, well, yes and no, in that we will continue to fight them. Brian, Jan, Barbara, we will continue to fight them. However, one thing that I know, and it's there also in Marilyn and Susan's work, is that when practices are embodied by teachers, they don't go away, okay? And Australian teachers will continue to teach with critical literacy and multiliteracies models as long as they have breath. And subsequently, in 2000, I joined the Literacy and Numeracy Secretariat in Ontario who had heard about the work. And now, I'm proud to say, Ontario, bless them. Whole school literacy plans, data walls, four resources in which teachers are told to make school level curriculum planning judgments about what their kids need, with what materials and so forth. We hope that Alberta will go there in due course, okay? Um, and I got word last year, Rich Tass, the Finnish government is, is adopting versions of Dewey and Rich Tass and have begun to erase their traditional disciplinary boundaries. So these things do have a half-life. I'd like to end, I've got 10 minutes, and I've made, I guess, three or four substantive points that, that aren't rhetorical and so forth. First, I wanted to talk a little bit about race and about whiteness. I spent three years in Singapore, and having lived in a white, white societies, all of my skills were as other. Were, my double consciousness was born in opposition. And suddenly I found myself a Han Chinese male in a Han Chinese ruling class environment on the other side of the fence. In a society where the hierarchy places Ong Mo, white people, and also Malaysian Muslims and Indians on some kind of lower linguistic, cultural, educational continuum. Indeed, we have multi-level analysis that will never be published. That show, that show the racial linguistic hierarchies in East Asian societies as well as we could find them here. In Singapore, many things happened. First of all, I went back and thanks to Peter Freebody and James Ladwig, I learned multi-level modeling and I learned quant, even though I failed year 11 maths. And that to me was a, a revelation. But for me also, seeing race and racism from the other side of the fence, opened my eyes, it opened my, it opened my eyes significantly. So when my Ong Mo or when my Australian colleagues would come visit me in Singapore, they would say, what do I need to know here? And the stock thing, and I've written about this in a couple places, the stock thing I would say to them is, how many different kinds of Chinese do you see? And they'd say, well, I don't understand the question. I'd say, you answered it. How many different kinds of whites do you see? I ask you that question to think about, okay? Because in Singapore society, as in Malay society, as in Beijing itself, there are hierarchies of class, of geographic location. My mother was a Guangzhou peasant. As Bourdieu would say, it was in her body. And one day I said to her when she was in her 80s, why don't you ask Aunt Maida to drive, to drive more? And she said, you don't understand. She said, see these hands? They're peasants' hands. Aunt Maida was a Shanghai Mandarin. So even displaced in another country, 70 years later, the embodied difference within difference, the class, the peasantry, is in our bodies. In Bourdieu's, in Bourdieu's sense, the, that, that body, it doesn't wash away. That, 
that those class bases, etc. So, in, and it's sure enough in Singapore, Singaporean Chinese, Mandarin speaking bilinguals, dialect speakers, PRC people, there are hierarchies of power, of status, of capital amongst Chinese. So similarly, what I would argue here, and I've just finished reading a book, and when we think about what's just happened in this country, is we cannot deal with questions of race without dealing with questions of class and intersectionality, full stop. We cannot study Roadville without looking at Tracton. We have a moral responsibility for social justice that extends to others, okay? And I'm reading a, a book right now that I've picked up on my Kindle by a Berkeley sociologist named Abelson with the unfortunate title, White Trash. And what she begins to document is the genealogy of Louisiana Cajun, the genealogy of Appalachia, something which is also covered in a magnificent book called Albion Seed. And what she argues, and part of what's happened, I believe, as an outsider, part of what's happened, is that America's fervent hope of a city on the hill without social class has turned into an ideology that there is no social class. That is certainly Ab Abelson's Abelson's premise. And that what happens is that when we, don't see, when we don't see social class, we fall into the traps of racialized binaries that become forms that divide and rule us. So what I believe has happened is that a divide and rule strategy of blaming others is being put in place as a dominant ideology. In Jakarta this week, there, two weeks ago in Jakarta, there were anti-Chinese and anti-Christian riots. In China right now, there is a huge issue with 12% of the population, Minzu, and all Uyghur have been asked to hand in their passports to be recertified. So the non-Han Chinese minorities are embattled throughout China. And similarly, the strategy of saying to low socioeconomic and impoverished whites that the problem is race has, has worked. It is a divide and rule strategy. Now, I wanted to read you two quotes. One is from W.E. Du Bois in 1937. And Du Bois wrote that so long as American labor is more conscious of color and race than it is of the fundamental needs of the whole laboring class. The development of labor solidarity is impossible. That's Dubois. And what Dubois is saying, they want you to fight. And Dubois himself said you cannot look at race without, and what he called the color line without looking at, and he coined the term in 1902, race capital. And he argued that slavery was not just genocidal, it was an act of capital, and it was an economic act as well. So we cannot, we need a complex intersectionality that looks at all forms of difference. We can do this quantitatively through multi-level analysis with tools that we never had before. We can do it through ethnographies that look through multiple eyes and multiple lenses at all levels. And I also want to, wanted to offer you a quote from my colleague who's now embattled, Noel Pearson, a leading Aboriginal lawyer and activist. And when Noel and I were flying into Hopeville, here I was, Deputy Director General, in a suit and a tie, and here's Noel going into an Aboriginal community to speak to elders. And we were flying in, and Noel was reading Francis Fukuyama, and we were talking about growing up Chinese, growing up Aborigine, etc. And Noel said to me about his Aboriginal community as we flew in, he said, They've taken away our traditional means of labor. They've given us no access to capital and gainful forms of employment. They've supplied us with alcohol and drugs. And they've created us an addiction on welfare. Now, I want you to think of all of the communities that that describes, OK, where you live. And many will be communities of color. 
but many will also be white communities as well, okay? All right, the second point that I want to make is when we started this work, they kept saying literacy is, oh, your work's too political, literacy isn't political. Well, I'm sorry, we told you so. <laughs> okay, of course literacy is political. Of course literacy is political. And I, where I differ with Brian, with my colleague Brian Street, is the autonomous ideological model, as he described it, was meant to describe his work in Iran, et cetera, that talked about the imp superimposition of an external model versus a cultural model, so he used autonomous and ideological. I believe the two strands of work in our history of Western literacy are actually moral and scientific. One being the lineage that we have from Martin Luther and Protestantism and the notion of everybody reading the Bible for them to decide from themselves. So there's always been a moral dimension of literacy being used as a tool to shape ethics, morals, and the moral character, whether we like it or not. And one of the arguments we've always made is whether you're teaching phonics or picture books, etc., that moral formation is always in order. On the other hand, after we went to, this is what academics do on holiday, after we went from Luther's place uh, in Wittenberg, we went to Leipzig, and I wanted to go to Leipzig to see if there were any remains of the laboratories of Wilhelm Wundt, where in 1849, Wundt, for his students, like G. Stanley Hall, invented the science of educational, of psychology as a prototype before William James and others came along. So sure enough, in that German tradition, we have both the scientific study of literacy, and E.B. Huey, G. Stanley Hall, William James, took their inspiration to take literacy out of the moral domain and place it into the scientific domain. Now, the worst that we could do would be to say, out with the scientific, in with the moral. Or the scientific is all right and the moral is right. These things are formative foundational elements for the way that Western literacy has been formed. Now put that with the theory of ideology. What is ideology? Ideology is, according to that obscure German Jewish philosopher. Ideology is the ideas of the ruling classes turned around as if he used the metaphor in a camera obscura, as if the lenses turn the world upside down. So dominant ideology for Marx was a deliberate distortion of truth on behalf of the interests of capital. Sorry, I didn't want to rant but I've been watching from afar what's going on here. It was a deliberate distortion in the promulgation of myths and untruths. And you, we live in an era of falsity and untruthfulness now. So what we need is a critical literacy. And so what I'm saying is that science can be enlisted for ideology. The third part of our trek after Leipzig and Wittenberg, the moral and the scientific, was Ken and Yetta, I, got, I had the privilege of speaking at Humboldt University where Dubois studied in the lecture hall. And when you lecture at Humboldt, you, my colleague from Kassel will know this, when you lecture at Humboldt, you go in and the plaque says, Hegel, Einstein, it gives you the list, okay? But when you lecture at Humboldt, the courtyard outside is where Goebbels, where they burn the books. And that, in a nutshell, is the history of Western literacy. Moral formation, scientific redefinition, and either of them can be twisted and used for political purposes to distort, to tell untruths, and to oppress people. So our task then is if anybody argued against a critical literacy. We need a critical literacy that helps kids navigate the relationship between representation and reality. I don't care, following Foucault, that if everything is discourse. Some discourses kill you. Some discourses don't matter much, okay? So my point is that just to say, oh, it's all representation and all representations are equal and we can endlessly deconstruct them, that postmodern moment is partly, indeed, what has led us to the problem. 
the planet and what is happening to the planet is not an artifact of discourse. The threats and the bullying that are described that are happening to children in the, in the cities and the fear that is happening are not purely artifacts for discourse. They are empirical, embodied, and they, they are happening as we speak. So I would make that argument again and again. <sighs> Finally, we must defend public education right now. The, the, the decay of the, the third form of social justice that Nancy Fraser talks about, in addition to recognitive and, and redistributive, is representative social justice. The best part of my doing in education in Los Angeles Unified was learning how to run meetings, how to vote, and how to debate. We got really good at it. The best elements of American education are these elements of civic education that teach you about how to contest and how to argue, okay? And we must retain those as part of, a, as part of an agenda of critical literacy. Well, before you despair, I want you to think about what Dubois went through as he left Fisk, left Nashville, went to Harvard, the only black man, went to Berlin, found, came back to found the NAACP, and then had his passport taken away because he was too left and, and moved to Ghana later in life. Read the memoir, it is in, of Dubois. If you don't know Dubois, at this late in life, and even to this songwriter, it's changed me reading Dubois. So, before anybody despairs, before anybody gets bummed out, think about that. Think about the battles that Ken and Yetta and Courtney's generation went through in the 1950s. And think about what Pat and I and some of us experienced in 1968, when we too had to decide which party to vote for and had our hearts broken and people were being killed. Okay? It's not a time for that, for despair. It's simply game on for all of you. This is your generational challenge. Thank you.